And you know, you press this so bad, they'll say, see, he's cognitively impaired. Just this week, we had the worst jobs report in modern history. You know, the word garbage is the hottest thing right now. Sir, it'll take approximately five years to defeat ISIS. Boom, inches from perfection. And then you see those arms like you grab your beautiful baby, your beautiful child, see? In the old days, I would have said, like you grab your girlfriend. Don't know. The official talking. Good afternoon, everyone from London. This is your latest The Officials podcast. And uh, to start, I would like to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. It's a good time to get together with family, to review, chat. Please don't talk about politics. They could be a little disturbing during your dinner. But hey, we're here in London, so we can talk about politics. So let's start with Trump. He's not the president yet, but he's the president already again. And of course, we are enjoying his outbursts, his uh, communication, his tweets or exes, whatever you want to call them, uh, and all the mayhem he causes at hyper speed. Man, the guy can move fast. He has put in so many cabinet members. Some of them didn't make it to the finish line but he is moving fast and definitely there is change in the air. Walkerism, my children should forgive me, but it's kind of behind us and a lot of other governments are getting that, uh, that message that they need to review that. But for our area of interest, I think is good and we're gonna discuss here with, with my guests in, in a few minutes, what it means uh, in terms of the tariffs, what it means for Mexico and Canada, their two, two neighbors there, what it means for the rest of the world as higher tariffs come in. Some people, of course, expect them not to be too high, but on average, there'll be some and they'll be painful. The uh, other item we're going to discuss today is, is OPEC breaking down. By all accounts, I mean, if we are going to say it straight, which we like to be, OPEC broke down a while ago. The amount of cheating going on uh, is, is huge. We have written about it in, in our reports and we have already been chastised. We shouldn't use the word cheating. We should use, use the word leakage. Please explain the difference to me when an OPEC member uh, is producing close to a million barrels a day extra, is that cheating or is that leakage or is that dumping? I don't know. You are the judge, you make the decision. Uh, the other things that we have in the plate for today is the D word for Europe. Uh, in Europe, they like the D word, the D day very much. And I think nowadays that means disaster, decline, the industrialization, industrialization, anything that starts with a D, demand destruction, everything. It's a mess here. I don't know if we have a good word that starts with a D for mess, but it is. And in China, just very briefly, some indicators are, are, are looking up, and, but when they look up, it's down somewhere else. And in one of those indications, Nissan from Japan, was uh, indicating that uh, they may not survive very long. Uh, and I, uh, they have as a partner, Reno, and maybe you guys uh, will talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but what it means is if they're very efficient and do something better, somebody else takes it on the nose, but that's how a market works. So let's work hard to become better. But to start, let's, let's talk a little bit about Trump. Let's start with uh, Harry. Harry, what do you think will happen if the 25% tariffs are applied to Mexico and Canada? Can they be imposed, number one? Yes, he could by executive order, uh, definitely on day one, like he tweeted, or was on Truth Social, so I guess as he posted, uh, make, that, uh, make that policy uh, uh, change, as in 
25% on all products, and it was all products, and then, of course, an increment uh, on the existing tariffs for China. Now, as far as Mexico and Canada, there are two aspects. Canada, obviously, is the energy aspect. If it's all products, does this include crude oil? And we know that a lot of U.S. refineries take Canadian crude oil, refine it to turn it into gasoline. So could this be inflationary for prices at the pump? That's one question. Mexico, I think it's more about, you know, merchandise goods and usual trade. When it, it could be cars, for example. There are a lot of cars manufactured in Mexico, white goods that are manufactured in Mexico. So this too, as well, is going to be inflationary, but from not necessarily the energy perspective, but from what the consumer may have to face when it comes to purchases of various uh, items, or let's say durable good type items, such as cars, washing machines, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that to me has almost a little bit of a smell of Trudeau destruction. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could, we could say uh, Justin Trudeau is not exactly of the same political stripe as a uh, 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 president like Donald Trump. And I would say that their, their general approach in terms of policy is certainly uh, different as well. I think he, Mr. Trump would not be unhappy to find a new partner in, a, in a, an election in Canada that would oust uh, Trudeau. So. And, and on a more global basis, and I'll, I'll turn to Will, as tariffs get put in place, and some countries have already, already threatened counter-tariffs, maybe a little bit of Europe, Canada, Mexico, what happens to global efficiency? How do you see that going in terms of global GDP? Yeah, well, it's going to be a drain on global output, really. Um, you know, you get a lot of gains in efficiency from trade. You, you're able to draw on comparative advantage of different, different economies. Uh, different economies naturally they excel at different things. So the, the optionality that you get as a consumer in the globalized world is much greater at a lower cost. You start introducing tariffs, that's only going to drive down efficiency and worsen the, the opportuni opportuni opportunities for the customer. Yeah, at a high level, that could mean lower global GDP than it would have been otherwise, and therefore lower energy consumption because uh, that comes with it. But as we sat down ahead of the uh, program, we were also talking about the dreams to add 3 million barrels a day of oil extra, until I was reminded, and it's a good point, that it's oil equivalent, not oil itself, because oil is extremely difficult to add in the short term. You need to drill a lot, you need to invest a lot, and as the systems are, it's a lot faster on NGLs. And as we look at the figures, and, and this was really blown, blowing my mind, is the NGL production in the US is close to 7 million barrels a day, compared to oil, as defined conventionally, including shale, at 13.2. And that means that oil is, uh, NGLs is more than 50% of the oil production. And as Harry was telling me, this also means that if US NGLs were the equivalent of an OPEC country, it would be number two in the production table. That's amazing. From a it? volume perspective, yes. Because Saudi currently is slightly above 9 million barrels per day. Next to the line is Iraq and, and the UAE. You know, so we're talking Iraq at four, uh, four and change, right? UAE close to four. And so 7 million barrels per day in terms of volume would place US and GLs between Saudi Arabia on a volume basis. And of course, the, the follow ups, which are uh, Iraq and Kuwait, sorry, Iraq and, and the UAE. So that's, uh, that, those are really, really seriously huge numbers. And they are going to put pressure on OPEC. And if the regulation comes in into the US, Trump is in, it will come in. There'll be more drill, baby drill. Uh, as more oil, more gas, more NGLs come in, the impact on OPEC gets heavier. And OPEC, uh, and you should read today's uh, officials uh, published this morning, Reflecting Asia. We put in some tables on, on production. The, the amount of cheating is really is, 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 is amazing. It's, it's really big. And according to our sources, uh, cheating is happening everywhere, including from Saudi Arabia 
not to the degree that is happening in the UAE, but everybody's leaking here and there. And despite the promises of containing production, even the OPEC plus guys, they also have more projects that they're bringing on, on stream for next year. Kazakhstan is one of them. So supply is coming up. Any, anything that you would like to add on those balances? No, it's, uh, it's obviously OPEC is stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. I mean, technically on, on the face of it, right? If they were to publicly say that they were producing more, then they risk obviously provoking a price slump. If they were to officially return barrels, they would provoke a price slump. And that we know how costly it is to, to contain supply at the expense of market share and the fiscal strain that it imposes on, on countries. So having leakage under these conditions is, is almost unavoidable. How much, of course, then we start getting into some political aspects because some of the leading leakers, if we could call them uh, that way, uh, leading uh, cheaters, I would say, but if, hey, I'm like with that. polite company here. <laughs> But it, it, it is certainly interesting because we've seen, you know, obviously in the past uh, 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 OPEC meetings where there have been requests to compensate for overproduction. So such requests went to Iraq and went to Kazakhstan. Interesting enough, no such demand was made for the UAE, which if we look at the numbers, you know, uh, now people could challenge these numbers, of course, but we think that production is at a minimum 3.8 million barrels per day, thereabouts, if not 4 million barrels a day. And you look at the quotas, well, as you're saying, you're roughly almost almost a million barrels a day above. So where's the admonishment, I suppose, you know? Yeah, uh, we'll put together a table uh, for us, which we will put on the, uh, on the program so you can read it. Uh, but essentially, we tracked down a minimum of three countries in, in the Middle East, Oman, Oman Qatar, and, uh, and Abu Dhabi. And yes, it's roughly a, a million extra. Yeah, a, mi a million exceeding the quota. Yeah. yeah. And, and those things eventually will lead to a lot of internal friction. Please note that the OPEC meeting was postponed from December 1 to December 5th. Uh, the uh, uh, justification is that there is a meeting in Kuwait that needs for this meeting to be postponed. But in the way we understand OPEC, and we have been following OPEC and talking to them for a long time, is when there is a postponement is because there is a lot of friction. And they cannot agree on what the polite big meeting is going to be like. So, so the fighting happens behind it. The real meeting happens before the meeting. And in the real meeting, before the meeting, they are disagreeing of what they're going to do, whether they are officially going to increase production, even though they are, and whether they're going to give UAE the permission to produce extra 300,000 barrels a day, even though they are producing over a, or nearly a million more a day. So it's a little bit nonsensical. Well, anyway, enough of that. Let's go now into the D world. And um, Will, you, you have been following all these uh, shutdowns, uh, companies reducing employment, uh, bad results. Uh, give, give us a summary of what is happening in Europe. Yeah, so there's not really much in the way of good news coming out of the industrial complex in Europe. Um, taking a look at ThyssenKrupp Steel, they've written down the value of their steel business by 2.8 billion euros. Um, they also announced 11,000 redundancies in, in the next couple of years. Uh, Ford are also planning to cut 4,000 jobs or 15% of its European workforce. Um, and Volkswagen are, are looking to close three of their German factories. So it's, it's, looking, it's looking pretty bad. And it seems that they're only really being kept afloat by debt. You know, they've had record issuance this year at 1.7 trillion euros. So it looks like that, that's really kind of the, the industrial complex is only just staying afloat through issuance. So we have been discussing in, in, in previous episodes how bad it is in Germany, and, and truly it is. The country is deindustrializing. The, the leaders are not doing it right by, by their people, and, but there are problems elsewhere. Uh, Harry, France, how is it looking to you? Oh, France, I guess the question on everyone's mind is, 
how long will the government hold? And uh, the very interesting thing is uh, with France is obviously the current Prime Minister, Mr. Barnier, is looking to cut expenditures, raise taxes in order to reduce the various fiscal ratios that, you know, he, he wants to, in order to reduce his fiscal ratios to something a little bit more palatable. Uh, but when you look at yields on French uh, bonds, they've reached the level of the yields on Greek bonds, which is unprecedented. When you think about what would be designated as a core Eurozone economy versus a periphery economy like Greece, having them borrow at the same rate is something of, of a surprise. The interesting thing is that, I mean, France is not the only one to have fiscal issues and uh, wanting to reduce its deficit and its debt to GDP ratio, etc. You also have Germany, but there you look at the spread between Bund yields and, and French OATs or the difference in their bond yields. And you look at basically the premium on French, uh, the French yield premium, if you will, just growing. So I, I think there's a perception that despite all the woes in Germany, there is political in, uh, stability, at least on a relative basis compared to France, where everyone's wondering if tomorrow the government is gonna face a vote of no confidence, Mr. Barnier and his government go away, what happens next, you know? So it almost seems fair that the price of a baguette is now the price of a sublaki, so to speak, right? I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting comparison, but all right. Are we going to have a baguette, uh, just like the Economist Big Mac index, yes, we'll have our, our baguette index worldwide just to figure it out, right? But, but more seriously, I, I was also uh, reading that as part of Barnier's uh, program, he wants to increase the price of electricity to, to the end user. And this is essentially what has been killing uh, the industry here in the UK, because the UK used to be in, to, in, in the top 10 industrial countries, and now it's not. And for anything you do industrially, you need electricity, you need energy. If you make it too expensive, it gets made elsewhere. Guess where? In China, right? And if France does these things, then uh, of increasing electricity prices, then it's gonna whack uh, industry uh, e even further. So it is not looking good. And that means that demand for energy next year gets affected by global deglobalization, gets affected by the, the economic decline in, U in Europe, and with more production, that means not very good things. One of the beneficiaries, of course, would be uh, China because production gets transferred there. And if energy is cheap, they benefit. So, so to close up the program, there have been some further signals from China that look uh, even better for us. Yeah, so um, recently, one of the concerning things in China has been uh, appetite for credit and appetite to take on debt. But um, it looks like the Chinese corporate issuance is, is showing pretty strong growth, actually. So in, in October, Chinese corporates issued $7.7 .7 billion in US dollar bonds. Um, and that's double from the same period last year. So that's a two times increase. So, so they're coming back. They're, they're coming back. Um, and, and the issuances have been pretty... Uh, pretty oversubscribed as well. So if you look at the 30-year yield on the Alibaba issuance, um, the prior estimates are, were, were around 1.3% above comparable treasuries is what, what they were expecting to pay. Um, but upon the issuance, it was so oversubscribed, it was about 1.05 over, over treasuries. So pretty, pretty strong. Situation. And on the oil front, they issued an additional quota of nearly 60 million barrels uh, to close the year. And that has affected, of course, the, the, the price of Dubai because the corporates such as Totsa at the front uh, have been buying a lot of Dubai to satisfy that, um, that demand. So China could be the, the one that surprises us on the plus side. Uh, on another uh, negative, but that has been negative for a long time, is Russia. The currency there is having major issues. Uh, and I think the Trump effect is causing all kinds of things globally, which is amazing even before he is the president. So we're going to be monitoring all those things uh, for you. Thank you to our guests here, here today and happy Thanksgiving to you all.
Thank you very much.